Hi, welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus. Today's podcast is centered around a Q&A that Ramdas gave. It's in the 80s. I don't have the exact date this time, folks. But um, so it's a, a, a number of different questions. And, and the reason this was picked by Nathan was that there's some great information here and questions that can really prove to be useful for our day-to-day uh, getting along, shall we say. Um, so here's some of the questions uh, uh, that are talked about, so you get an idea. There's, there's talk about boundaries, uh, how, uh, how we can let go of boundaries, how do we cultivate boundaries, and... Um, how we can set boundaries without being trapped by them. And he uh, he gives an amazing <laughs> story that's funny, 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 as Ramdas can be, around him wanting to get a hot tub for his house uh, that he had just gotten in Marin County, and how he went through all sorts of mental gymnastics about uh, how that would peg him in a way as this effete kind of yogi. And so he was not willing to do it. And he went through all this. Uh, as he does, he was very honest about his uh, mental tribulations on that. Um, there's some great quotes in, in, in all of these questions and answers uh, that you'll find. Um, there's one from, from uh, Mahatma Gandhi. My understanding of truth shifts from day to day. My commitment must be to truth, not consistency. I love that one. I heard that before. Uh, you'll see how that relates to what he's talking about with boundaries when you listen to this. Um, there's a, ta- a question about the guru and what is the guru? And uh, he talks about trusting intuitive heart regarding the guru, and everyone has an inner guru, whether they manifest as a physic- in physical uh, in a lifetime or not, and they don't need that. And uh, he talks about Maharaji, our guru, named Karoli Baba, as an imaginary playmate, and he said he turns out to be real, and I'm the imaginary thing. Um and and there's a great story of how he, uh, you know, Maharaji, as many of you know, listening to this podcast and listening to Mind Rolling and all, uh, if you do, how he uh, he would absolutely know everything about everybody, past, present, future. And, uh, and he would let everybody know that, and your mind kind of got blown. So there's a great story of a friend of Ramdas is a professor from Canada that comes there. And... Um, Ramdas is like, okay, this is going to be great. This guy's mind's going to get blown. He's going to tell him everything about it. And he ends up, Maharaji, of course, tells him about himself. Everything he says is absolutely wrong, <laughs> totally wrong. And the guy walks away. Okay, that was interesting. And then privately, of course, he tells Ramdas exactly everything about this person <laughs> that he couldn't have known. Um, Maharaji was um, enigmatic. Um, another question around psychedelics. So, uh, interesting in that one about talking about how the efficacy of psychedelics, especially for, uh, addiction and, um, people going through dying process and so on. And he's, so this is back in the eighties and he's saying, it's just horrible how research has been stopped. Isn't it interesting now that they are, the government is allowing this research to go on and they're showing, uh, results. I know of several different things through Johns Hopkins and other uh, facilities, and they're showing how it's really helping with uh, addiction, PTSD, and dying. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, uh, there's a, a, Q and a, a Q about uh, methods and how methods can be traps, and uh, hopefully they self-destruct at the end. And uh, there's one part of this that's kind of cute, uh, where it's, he's talking about methods and, and so on, and uh, and he talks about 
the, uh, for instance, the Zen method and the focus on, on uh, Buddhism, on emptiness and how that concept's pretty difficult. Um, and he talks about how the bhakti path, is, is, he refers to it kind of as a slow path for the lame and the halt. <laughs> Uh, that's cute, he, and he calls he calls the Buddhist the, the emptiness, uh, the empty mis, mishpucha, which is uh, as he calls it a Sanskrit Jewish word, y- Yiddish word. Um, it's funny because I had a, a a similar dialogue with Roshi Joan Halifax at this last spring retreat we did in Maui, and um, and she was referring to the bhakti path as, you know, it's duality. And uh, in duality, you're eventually going to have to cut through duality because otherwise you're staying completely in reference to uh, this and other. And uh, to be completely free, you have to uh, enter into non-duality, which uh, she was referring to as, uh, an, uh, you know, as the ultimate path. Not in any kind of, it was in a in a very loving way she did it. But I still came back and I said, "Well, listen, Roshi. You you who have yeah, I have like uh, probably a, a gazillion more lifetimes to go to get to where you already are." She didn't like that. She <laughs> no, don't be silly. Um, what else? He talks about uh, relationship. See, there's a lot of rich stuff in here. It's this is cool. This Q and A. Uh, relationship, how we react to each other, differentiate, uh, differentiating beings to their actions. Um, and here's here's a beautiful thing uh, that we all need to uh, remember on a day-to-day basis. Uh, it's whenever we get into any kind of conflict with, with anybody uh, and we're trying to work it out, uh, you know, it's pretty much of a, a pretty much of a predicament. It's always up to the most conscious person in any dynamic to let go the soonest, right? Haven't we all experienced that? Um, What else? Talks about how you bring peace in the presence of violence. So there's some good references there that certainly apply to a lot of stuff that's going on today, for sure. And then it, uh, I think the last question is around the, what's the agenda of a human incarnation. And he quotes Gandhi again, my life is my message. And uh, that's something Ram Dass has quoted many times before. So some uh, great varied material. Usually we have, uh, you know, we cut uh, up a talk and we'll take, and it usually has one, you know, one kind of formal topic that he uh, runs around. This one's got a bunch of different things, which is makes it uh, interesting. So, Let's go ahead. We're going to go and listen to this, but I, I do want to uh, remind everybody uh, again uh, that um, we uh, appreciate the support, especially we just had this great uh, summer med- uh, mindfulness meditation course, and we did that webcast a week ago that, with, that I did with Ram Dass. It was uh, re- the end of it. You can find it on, on uh, just go to ramdas.org Media Library or YouTube, and you can find... Uh, the uh, it was August second, I believe. Uh, you can find it, and uh, there's also a segment we took, which is what I'm trying to say, is the last twenty odd minutes. Ramdas just went into this beautiful place of presence. If you want to just sit, talk about you know we're this beautiful meditation course with all sorts of different methodology and so on and so forth uh, to get to the place of presence just being completely here and now and present and mind is not doing going anywhere and time and space just shuts down for a moment ramdas got completely into that place i was uh, sitting there transfigured on skype with him so uh, yeah take a listen to that and thanks for the support on that it was was tremendous and we, and we do need the for you to continue that support Go to ramdas.org. Of course, you can just donate. You can get some downloads. You can get some stuff in the store. You can buy some stuff through Amazon. We get a little piece of it, just like that. I always talk about on Mind Rolling with MindPod Network. Um, There are many different ways. um, And just sharing is the biggest way. So, uh, and I want to remind everybody, we've got um, 
we're we're getting closer and closer to the announcement about the new book which is all of our experiences of meeting Ramdas and going back to India, Krishna Das and myself and Rameshwar Das, who writes those books with Ram Das and Dr. Larry Brilliant and Danny Goldman, all kinds of incredible people that are really um, out there in the public eye uh, since coming back from India in those days and how that all happened and the direct experience. It's kind of like son of miracle of love. <laughs> it's a miracle of love too, except it's all Westerners, whereas miracle of love for the most part was Indian st- uh, people's stories of meeting uh, Maharaji. So look for that. That's going to happen September 8th and I'll keep prompting you. So, uh, 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 about how you can really support that. So, uh, sorry, went into this whole long-winded thing, and you want to hear this thing. So here it is, Ramdas, here and now, and uh, Q and A from the eighties. I don't know what we're going to call this, but we'll figure it out. Here you go. See you next week. I think the way it fits together. She's talking about boundaries, and letting go of boundaries, and cultivating boundaries. It seems to me that you, co- you start out trapped in boundaries and then you extricate yourself from the entrapment and then come back in being able to take on the boundaries as the way you costume yourself for the dance and you learn how to define limits and realize who you are and what your unique role is and realize that you can set boundaries without being trapped by them because they're functional units. I'll give you a bizarre example. I was doing this course about homelessness last fall. My father had died uh, the year previous, and that, or that year, and that freed me from living to take care of him, so then I moved to California to be closer to some of the other SAVA board members so we could work more deeply together. And it turned out that I was offered for rent a carriage house in Marin, California, which is, some of you may know about Marin. (laughs) So it's across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. Um, And this carriage house was absolutely a, a dream carriage house. Deer walked in the backyard. It was beautiful. But it, had, it needed two things. It needed a fireplace. And it really desperately needed a hot tub because... <laughs> I mean, you just can't have a house in Marin without a hot tub. It's like, a, it's, it's an indecency. So um, uh, there I was teaching the course in the homeless in New York and hanging out with homeless people and buying a sleeping bag here or something or a tent or, you know, just hanging out. And at the same time, the house was being prepared for me in California and I was having this hot tub, uh, albeit I got it wholesale, but it was still like 3,200 bucks for this hot tub. It was an eight-sided tub. It's very big. And so I call it the eight-fold bath of the of the upper middle way. (laughs) But see, then the question was, am I going to tell the homeless that I'm doing this? I mean, you see the problem. You know, I mean, you're working with people that have nothing and you're working with other people who you're helping open to people who have nothing and there you are building a hot tub. And I thought about not building the hot tub. And then I realized that probably for years I would be the person who didn't build the hot tub. And so I decided to tell everybody. So I told them. They did very well with it. They said it was probably therapeutic. That's what New Yorkers would think of a hot tub. I mean, you know. I mean, it is, actually, you know. Makes me happy. But I realized how delicate that whole issue was, that I was honoring where my space was, 
I wasn't doing violence to myself, and yet I was risking telling people who might not understand how I could do that. And I was defining a boundary that was the boundary that I was comfortable with at the stage I'm at. Maybe later I will turn the hot tub into a something else, who knows. There is no rule book for how we play this one out. Simone Weil, a beautiful philosopher, she was an incredible Belgian, I believe. And she saw how things were and she said, I can't live any better than the poorest person in the world. And she starved to death in her 30s. I don't know how you have to do it. I just know how I am doing it. And tomorrow it'll be different. As Gandhi said when he was leading a march and then he stopped it, and the people said to him, Mahatmaji, you can't stop this march. People left their jobs to follow you. He said, I'm a human. I only understand relative truth. Only God knows absolute truth. My understanding of truth shifts from day to day. And my commitment must be to truth, not to consistency. Think about that one. That's a big one for us. How many of us have let consistency override truth? In order to appear so we don't upset anybody else, so we appear to be the same person we were yesterday, we deny stuff in ourselves, because each of us is thousands of beings. And how delicate it is to be consistent all the time. So we move in and out of roles. So finally, we're free to play the roles without being trapped by them. Questions? Yes. She's asking about gurus and how do you know one and how do you get one and if you walked away from one, what does it mean? And um, guru is a funny word. It's not teacher. It's not somebody that points the way. It's somebody that is the way. And the way, the reason they are the way is because they're nobody. If they're somebody, then they're just somebody else. So then they point the way. Because, I mean, my guru, no matter how much I knew him, I could never find him. I mean, I couldn't figure out who he was. Everything I thought he was, he wasn't. Once I thought he was very wise, and then and I thought he understood everybody's mind, he could read minds. And then this guy came, this professor from Canada came to visit me in India, and I proudly brought him to my guru so that my guru could show off. My guru said to him, you come from the United States? And the guy says, no, I come from Canada. Acha. You have many brothers and sisters. No, I'm an only child. And Maharaji kept doing that until I thought, oh my God, you know, and as, as the guy was leaving, he says, very nice guru you've got. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. And then later I walked back in and Maharaji told me the guy's whole life history. He was just putting me on. Every time you think you got him, you don't. The only way a guru, the guru relationship is a relationship that only exists in the heart. It does not, it cannot be mediated through the mind. The thinking search for the guru and the judgment is this my guru is all nonsense. That's the mind. I would have gotten rid of him in a minute if I could have. I mean, there are much more pucker gurus than him. His blanket kept falling off, really schlock, you know. But once the heart's opened, you can't get rid of him. And a lot of people start out thinking, see, because there's, there's an ambience around those people and the devotees are really horrible. They all become fanatics because their faith is flickery, so they have to convince everybody else that this is the guru. So it's this, each guru is surrounded with a mafia of people that are really militant and greedy and possessive and ugh, you know, it's horrible. So um, you get sucked in by that sometimes. And then after a while, you realize you've been had again. And you just got to trust your own intuitive heart. Only you know. 
And you only know from moment to moment. And there's no way, uh, the relation between everybody has an inner guide. And it turns out to be you, of course. I mean, what you do is like you, you have an inner guide, which you imagine is, ima like Maharaji's dead. He left his body in 73. So you could say he's my inner guide. He's like my imaginary playmate. And he's got, if you're going to have an imaginary playmate, which kind would you like? Would you like one that's all wise, all humorous, all empty, all compassionate? I would. So that's my imaginary playmate. It turns out that finally he turns out to be real and I turn out to be imaginary. That's how the story comes out in the end. But you don't realize that at first. You really think you're somebody. Then you realize you're a puppet. Hanuman, the monkey, says to Ram, who's the form of the formless God at that, in that particular storyline, uh, Ram says to Hanuman, who are you? Hanuman says, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. And that's the relation of the guru. Questions? First question is, how can you know you're not making errors that are increasing suffering when you work to relieve suffering? And the answer is you don't. And all you can do is stay open with your heart and your mind and be as impeccable as you know how to be and be willing to admit you've blown it and made errors. We at Seva have made many errors. I can list many errors in which we went in with such well-meaning hearts, but we bungled it because we were, in our zeal to do good, we didn't listen carefully enough. And we weren't just impeccable enough. And there are some really stinkers. They're so subtle, you'd never get them. You'd never get them. Like we work, for example, here's an example. We work with three Guatemalan uh, refugee camps in Mexico, in Chiapas. And in the course of our work together with these really wonderful people, they've developed a sense of community, although they come from different villages. They've developed an organizational structure that makes them effective in order to be able to better their lot. We've got tool banks there now where they rent a, a tool for half a penny and then they, when the, by the time the money's, the tool's broken, they can buy another tool. And, I mean, the whole game is one of self-sufficiency and beauty and dignity and it's all wonderful and it looks great and we've just been able to be the catalyst for that to happen. Doesn't that feel good? However, most of them want to go back to Guatemala. And the government of Guatemala is very threatened by any Guatemalan, any Mayan Indians that are at all sophisticated about administration. So that in our very zeal of making these people more effective to keep their lives going in Mexico, we have reduced the likelihood they can ever go back to Guatemala without being murdered. Isn't that bizarre? So what do you do? Not help? Do you help? What you do is you sit down with them and you all share the predicament together. And then you figure out what to do. Okay? Those are examples. They're bizarre. They're great. I mean, this is really the stuff of growth. You don't expect that everything you do is going to be good. You just do it with a good heart, with an intention to do good, and you listen. You constantly listen. Questions? Yes. Well, because I was saying no, except I was spelling it K-N-O-W. Um, I, uh, I first uh, ingested chemicals to alter my consciousness because people that I knew and respected were describing the ways in which it opened them to an understanding of their psyches uh, that their studies of psychology had not opened them to. And since I was a psychologist, Psyche Logos, it uh, seemed very appropriate for me to do that experimentation. 
And what I saw, as others saw, was that the nature of the experience you had with psychedelics was very much a function of your set and setting, that is, of the expectations you had in your mind and the environment in which you had the experience. So that if you thought it was schizophrenic inducing, that's what you get. And if you were taking it like the peyote ceremony with the Native American church, you would be experiencing it in order to be with God. And so we began to study the set and setting and the way different people use these chemicals in different ways. And um, so that's answering your question, why I started. I won't go into the whole drug thing unless somebody pushes me. Yes. Where are you? Who's that? You? Oh, okay. I, I called him, she stood up, and you spoke, so it's okay. It's okay. Wait a second. You sit down now. I'll start with him, and I'll get all three of you. Go ahead, you. Go ahead. Uh, the issue of uh, chemicals we're raising now. Um, the... Um, what is happening with... Um, with chemical use in this culture, be it um, tranquilizers or um, coffee or liquor or coke or crack or heroin or whatever, or just the addictions of the society, whether it be power or sex or whatever, um, acquisition, they're very intense because the fear is great and when you get frightened you get very uh, addicted. And um, the Addictions we're seeing, like with crack, are inner city because of the lack of opportunity. The coke among the middle class is because, as I said before, the fantasies aren't fulfilling. So they're all symptoms of problems. We're responding to the symptoms with a kind of overkill of categorizing all chemicals together, except the ones of cultural choice, like alcohol, as bad. Um, and saying say no to drugs, but there are a category of chemicals called uh, tryptamines, psychedelics, so on, that are um, very, very promising in terms of their use in a culture to, for therapeutic purposes, to help people break out of the sets that they're trapped in with their minds, to open relationships up again, like marriages that get stuck, to work with prisoners who have a terrible recidivism rate statistic, to help people die, to help people with pain, etc. All that research in those areas has been stopped because of this sort of just blanket pervasive paranoia about drugs. And it's very unfortunate. And um, I spoke at a conference recently in which there is a great attempt to legitimize research with MDMA or ecstasy or atom to see it in working in uh, relationship therapy. That's going on in Switzerland, it probably is going on in Germany and we hope it'll go on in Czechoslovakia and some of the countries that don't have the same panic that we have at this moment that we're importing as our drug war. Um, I think each of us can get educated can be calm about it, can do what you have to do knowing the conditions you exist in. This is not quite the climate at this moment for drug research. Um, but many people do it anyway. And you do it knowing that part of the setting is paranoia. And that's a delicate situation. It's not optimum conditions for that kind of inner work. We've learned over the years that no method is necessary so that if, if those kinds of drugs are not available for altering behavior, we certainly know that there are other ways of doing it. I think what we've just got to do is extricate ourselves from the value judgments about it and not make them into ethical issues, but realize that drug use, a lot of people use drugs to escape Others use it to explore. Others use it to get more. And the, the attachment to excess is what the problem is in the society. 
and, to the, and, the, and the attachment to the avoidance of pain is what the problem is, rather than drugs per se. So all I can suggest is education and thoughtfulness and being straight with people about the way you see it. You, sir. I agree with you. I think that, as I say to you, all methods are traps. I said it before. Drugs are traps, gurus are traps, any conceptual, even trying, even the thought that there is enlightenment is a trap. The whole game is a trap. But still, that doesn't mean you don't use the methods. You use the methods knowing full well that for them to work, you get trapped, and all you hope is that they self-destruct at the other end. Because to not use methods doesn't satisfy the yearning of the heart. The yearning of the heart. And the best method is no method. That's the Krishnamurti or uh, whatever those guys are, the Vedantists or the, you know, whatever the, the, the empty Mishpacha are. They're the ones that, you know, say don't stand anywhere. And I agree, I agree. The question is, can you go directly there? If you can, do it. If not, there are some slow paths for the, you know, the lame and the halt. That's all I'm saying. Is that all right? Can you hear it? Okay. Now the lady that stood up. I think it's very important that we differentiate between beings and the actions of beings. And that we understand that actions are good or evil to the extent that they create suffering or do not create suffering. <coughs> and that as we are more conscious, we appreciate the predicament that human beings, because of their attachment to their desires, perform actions, many of which create suffering in themselves and others. And that it behooves us as we become con more conscious, A, to not perform those actions ourselves, and B, to create conditions to minimize others performing those actions. But if you close your heart towards somebody who has acted against somebody else with a closed heart, you have perpetuated the root problem of the social situation, which is the closeness of the heart. So the, the profound requirement is that you say no to an act without closing your heart to the being. And that is a hard thing to do, especially when someone's done you wrong. But done you wrong is an interesting image. First of all, it requires a you to be done wrong to. See, if somebody, the Buddha once, a man came whose children had become followers of the Buddha and they, he expected them to go into the family business, so he was very upset. And he came to the Buddha and he said, um, he was very angry and he screamed at the Buddha. And the Buddha said, sir, if somebody comes to your home and brings you a gift and you don't accept it, what do they what do you do? What do they do? And he says they have to take it away. They're... And Buddha said, Well, I don't accept your gift. Now the the implication of that story is that if somebody lays a trip on you. It takes two to tango in an interesting way. That it takes you to accept being part of that gift. Now take rape, for example. I have many friends who have been raped because I'm available to people that are suffering or frightened or dealing with stuff. 
Some of those people that are raped have felt violated. But some of them have come to me quite surprised because what they felt was fear and violation, but they also felt tremendous compassion for the pain of the person that was raping them. My sense is that when we get busy feeling put upon, persecuted, hurt, like my parents did things to me that have left me in a way psychologically crippled in certain ways, neurotic in certain ways, distorted, sexual behavior, all kinds of things that are the result in some way of what they did to me. But the interesting thing is when I understand them better, I see that they were being who they were. They were conditioned the way they were and they were doing what they were doing because they were doing it. They weren't even doing it to me. They were just doing it. The fact that I bought it is my problem. The fact that they did it is theirs. It's an interesting one. I went through years when I was angry at my parents for what they did to me. Now I don't have any of that. That's all gone. <clears throat> I feel sad for them for what they were doing out of what they were caught in. But I still love the soul that is my mother and my father that was those bodies that did that stuff. It's not easy to be a human being. But don't get too seduced in by the drama of your personal history because it ends up in a funny way disempowering you at the same moment as it is empowering you. And I am sorry if I hurt your friend but it comes out of this understanding of the way the universe works. Okay? Questions? Sir? I think that there's a distinction. We're talking about anger and the feeling of it and the expression of it. Um, I, um, there are times when expression of anger is a release. Um, oftentimes, the expression of anger reinforces the expression of anger. I really think it's important that you cultivate the quietness to be able to appreciate the feelings of anger. I think that's important, that you be a witness to it and own your feelings of it. The difference between owning your feelings and expressing them are two different things. And often when you express them, you, in, by the expression itself, you create new karma. And from a karmic point of view, the art is to extricate yourself from old karma to the point where you're not creating new karma. And so, the, as long as you're not acknowledging your own feelings, you're in deep trouble. The acknowledgement of the own feelings and then the question of whether you can let them go without running them through. Because you see that as if I say to my mother, you done me wrong and I'm angry, she then gets defensive in response to what I just said she starts her thing and we keep playing the one out. If I can acknowledge it and then let it go because I appreciate the predicament we're both in, there is a possibility that we can let go at that moment. The minute it's up to the most conscious person in any dynamic to let go the soonest. Okay, So that's an art form. And, but yet at, there are times when it's wonderful to beat pillows and express it in whatever way to just realize, to allow the feeling to come out. I think part of the maturity of us is an ability to feel grief, to feel remorse, to feel sadness, to allow it to not be afraid of it, to allow it to work its healing way because that's part of what being a mensch or a, you know, a, that's a Sanskrit word for a, a, full, a full being is. Questions? Up top. 
Uh, the answer of how you can, what you can do to bring peace in, in presence of violence, uh, I think the answer is uh, a peaceful being lives in a peaceful universe and you start out by the work on yourself to be able to bring into those situations equanimity and a peaceful heart. And when you can do that, when you can see injustice and not get so angry and so frustrated and so furious that your very being is just adding vibrationally to the whole trouble, then you are an instrument of healing, of peace. So one works on oneself, but then how you do that is, the way I understand it is, you do what you do, so that if Northern Ireland is the place, maybe you are in Northern Ireland, and maybe you're just doing something in a peaceful way in Northern Ireland, and that's what you're contributing. Maybe you're just talking about it in ways with other people that dissipates a lot of the anger about it. Just by the quality of your generosity, of your kindness, of your appreciation of the pain of all the people involved. It's the work on ourselves, and then we manifest it as we manifest it. One person is a school teacher that works with children. Another is an activist in Ireland. Another person is somebody who's doing public relations. Another is somebody doing lobbying. You do what you do. There's no one thing to do for peace. We each do what we do. It's the quality of the who it is that does it. Is that dealing with your question? Okay. Questions? Yes. Do you all hear that? Huh? No, okay. He said that I was pointing out that this culture works because it's in opposition to something and that I was showing that I was in opposition to suffering. And what club was I going to join when suffering was all gone? Okay. Well, a reassuring thing for my club is that suffering is never gone as long as people incarnate because it's inherent in the whole process of incarnation. As Buddha pointed out, birth is suffering, death is suffering, old age is suffering, sickness is suffering, not getting what you want is suffering, getting what you want is suffering because it's in time and space and it's going to pass, so you got it. I mean, you know, it's, it's a veil of tears, baby. So <clears throat> suffering is not going to go out of style. But the interesting question is whether you're against suffering, and I would take this, uh, exception to the fact that I'm in a league against suffering because I deal with the paradox that suffering is grace and it's perfect and at the same moment it stinks. So my human heart says I've got to do something about suffering and I do it even though I understand that suffering is perfect, including my desire to end it because I'm suffering because of the suffering, okay? So we're in this web of complex stuff around it, but it's not just a simple against sin type thing, okay? Yes. How do people keep a conscious relationship? All I can tell you is that we are constantly going to sleep and our egos are so clever. Each one will say, now you are connected to the real truth. I mean, I really see how it is and I want you to know you're hung up. See? And the fact is that it's the blind leading the blind. I mean, there's no, this is a tricky one. And all you can do is keep going for the clarity and the quietness that allows somebody maybe to have a little bit of cl clarity in the midst of the confusion. I, I sit with a person and we focus between the eyes of the other person and we sit cross-legged and just, or in chairs and just look this way. And then we start to share with each other more and more of the things that we can't share with each other. And it's very scary, the game. And we keep letting go of all the feelings that arouses because we understand the truth is one of the vehicles for coming through to living spirit in human relations. And it's very scary stuff. And it's got to be truth that is 
has the quality of love to it. This, a heart has to be sought. And when it doesn't, it wounds, and then everybody can stay wounded or they can let go of the wound, depending on which game they want. There is a game of using relationship to come into union with the one. It is a hard game to play. There are many ways to stop along the way and smell the pretty flowers and forget the game. That's all. You hear it. Yes. I think the agenda of each human being is the same, which is Gandhi's line, my life is my message. That is, that I realize that the optimum thing I can offer into the total situation for its healing is a quietness of mind so that I can hear clearly from moment to moment just what's happening. I can hear the existential situation fully in the sense of grokking it, meaning merging, being one with it. And my heart is open in the sense that I am willing to risk, I can love, I can flow into the world. And that is as much, for us, that's why Save is exciting as an institution because that's the same d demand on that institution as it is on the individual. So that we do circle sharing to arrive at a truth and a quietness in our own beings so that we're really straight with each other and quiet and we cultivate through our service the quality of love that is not manipulative or grabbing or possessing or ripping off but just spacious love. These are techniques that we work on in the process of doing service to get done with the problems of the way service creates suffering. And, uh, I, I just don't, I see the plan starts with the individual. And that, I mean, I speak at many peace rallies. I speak at many anti-nuclear issue things. I speak at a lot of these things. I speak at AIDS conferences. In all of this, I must say that I am often confronted with very angry people. And in the peace movement, there are many angry people. And it's very perplexing how an angry person expects to bring about peace. And I really hear it coming back to the quality of the work on the individual. And I must say the peace groups are very willing to listen to these issues. I mean, it's, it's because the work you do, I've got two minutes to stop. The work you do in a community becomes the way you the way you work on yourself. I was speaking to the Great Peace March, a group of people that were walking across the country for peace, a beautiful group. Speaking to them in Iowa, I think, or somewhere. And I was saying to them, the way you walk across this country, that's it. That's the statement you're making. The way you meet every shopkeeper, the way you meet every person, the way you and I meet everybody in every supermarket, at every filling station, all of it, all the time. Every one of those is another way in which the spirit has come in drag saying, am I gonna suck you in to thinking of me as them and then protecting yourself or are you gonna open to me and here we are? Until pretty soon you see that it's all an exercise and you just keep doing it and that's the root out of which peaceful action finally comes. You keep working on it. We have to stop, the boss just told me. Ladies and gentlemen, in, the, in India, when we meet and part, we say namaste, which means I honor the place in you where when you are at rest in yours and I am at rest in mine, there is only one of us. Namaste. Thank you. Good night. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you. Thank you.